This is what Seoul, the capital of South Korea, looked like in the 1960s. And this is what it looks like today. Just a couple of decades ago, South Korea was a hugely underdeveloped country with mostly uneducated population and economy that was performing worse than the North Korean one. Today, the country has completely transformed. It has better infrastructure than most European countries, it's churning out hundreds of thousands of university graduates every year, and there is a good chance you have some Korean-made products at home. In the span of one generation, South Korea went from a third world country to one of the most developed on the planet. But it came with a price. The same factors that caused the economic miracle are now damaging the entire Korean society. South Korea has the highest number of suicides in the world. Young people are desperately struggling to find jobs. And Koreans are among the unhappiest nations in the world. So what was the secret of the Korean economic miracle? And why do the Koreans now have to pay for their own success? This is the dark side of the Korean miracle. In the mid-1950s, Korea's starting position was not ideal. Actually, it could hardly be worse. For most of the first half of the 20th century, South Korea has been under Japanese occupation that was purposely keeping Koreans without education and access to qualified jobs. After the Second World War, the Japanese finally left, but the country was immediately divided between the US-backed South and Soviet-backed North. And just a few years after, the North attacked the South, and the war that broke out destroyed almost all the industry and infrastructure that existed in the South. By the end of the war in 1953, most of South Korea's population was illiterate. Its economy was basically just agriculture, and its prospects for the future were looking bleak. But at the same time, this was when the Korean miracle was just about to begin. There are basically three main factors that made the Korean economic growth possible. The first was the decision of the Korean government in the early 1960s to transform the economy from agricultural to industrial. But the way they decided to do that was quite unique. Instead of supporting small businesses, the government decided to build a new economy on several hand-picked family-owned companies. These chaebols, as they would be called, would be given enormous support from the government in forms of loans, subsidies, tax breaks, and any other support they would need. Basically, they didn't have to play by the same rules as everyone else. And if they got in trouble, they would get bailed out. And in exchange, they would deliver the economic growth that the government wanted and aggressively expand abroad. And it worked. As these chaebols started to produce cars, TVs, games, electronics, and literally everything else, and as they were turning into gigantic global corporations, they needed a lot of workers. And since these were advanced products with complex supply chains, they needed qualified people. Engineers, managers, accountants, in other words, they needed people with college education. And the Korean government was happy to provide that as well. And so the education fever began. They Basically, since the end of the war, Korea was going through an unprecedented education boom. Once South Korea gained independence, the government opened up access to education to everyone. It started heavily promoting the idea that a university degree is necessary for anyone to have any kind of success in life, and pushing universities to admit as many students as possible. And it worked. Achieving college education, especially in STEM subjects, quickly became the main priority for every kid and every parent in Korea. Within just a few decades, South Korea went from a country where only 22% of people could read and write in 1945 to the most educated country in the world, where more than two-thirds of young people have a university degree. And once there was enough of qualified, educated employees working in these chaebols, they would make sure that they were hard. Nowadays, South Koreans are known to have extreme work ethic and to work longer and harder than anyone else. But that wasn't always the case. The Korean culture of incredibly hard work was mostly created during the economic boom by the chaebols that started systematically indoctrinating their employees with complete and absolute loyalty to the company. The idea was that it's not just a job, it's an absolute commitment to the success of the company. And the company comes first, before family, personal life, your free time, or anything else. Your job was your life. 
and the work environment made sure that it was not just a phrase. It became common to spend extremely long hours at work, to work evenings and weekends, and to spend time with your coworkers after work as well. Until today, after hours drinking with your boss is still extremely common in South Korea, and it's not voluntary and you can't go home before your boss decides it's time. But once again, it worked. South Koreans now work longer hours than literally any other developed nation in the world. And their dedication was one of the things that helped to start up the economic boom. So that's the secret of the Korean miracle. Gigantic monopolized companies supported by the state, population where almost everyone has college education, and a culture of extreme work ethic. But if all that worked, then where is the dark side of all of this? Well, while this did make the Korean miracle happen, and it worked for a while, it's not really working anymore. And all those three reasons are becoming more and more toxic and damaging not just for the economy, but for the society as a whole. So here's what went wrong. There's an interesting paradox when it comes to chaebols in South Korea. Together, they make up about 85% of the country's GDP. Just Samsung alone makes up almost 20% of the entire Korean economy. But the chaebols actually represent only about 10% of jobs in South Korea. And the reason for this is that over the years, they became really good at growing without actually having to hire too many new people. As an economics professor from Seoul National University said, the big companies have mastered a business model to survive without boosting hiring in order to save money. But these are the companies that have most of the qualified and most prestigious jobs. And that's where everyone wants to work. And while at one point Korea had too many jobs and not enough qualified people, today the situation is the complete opposite. Because the education fever in Korea was so successful, Korean universities are now churning out hundreds of thousands of college grads every year. But it's getting extremely hard for them to find jobs after graduation. College graduates in South Korea now face higher unemployment than people without college degree, which is unheard of anywhere else in the rest of the world. It's been actually so bad that the government had to launch a program to help college educated young people get a job abroad so that they don't stay jobless in Korea and don't fall into poverty. Basically, even when the Korean economy is doing well, the benefits are not really trickling down to the regular people. And none of these college grads wants a manual labor type of a job, because these jobs have a low pay and they are looked down on in the Korean society. And so there is a lack of people in blue collar jobs on one hand and a ton of unemployed young people that can't use their college education on the other hand. And in a society obsessed with success and education, that's obviously all the more frustrating. And the reason why all these college grads want qualified jobs is because they had to work incredibly hard to get their education. Because of the perceived importance of education, the South Korean education system has turned into the most competitive one in the world. Not only that it's incredibly hard to get into a good university, but children, including the youngest ones, have to work just as hard as the adults just to keep up with the rest. 83% of 5-year-olds in South Korea attend after-school private education, and families spend on average 16% of their income on private education. The Korean government even had to ban private tutoring sessions after 10pm in an attempt to decrease the insane workload that Korean children deal with. But despite all that, South Korea has experienced massive education inflation. While kids and students work harder than ever to get formal education, the advantage of such education is disappearing, because even with a top degree, they still can't get a job. And those who do manage to get a job find themselves in a stiff, extremely hierarchical work environment where people are promoted based on how loyal they are, rather than their performance and results. And even though Koreans spend long longer hours at work than anyone else, their productivity is actually surprisingly low. It's a culture that values working hard more than working smart, but that's not really working so well in the 21st century anymore. And the effect of the extreme work culture, societal pressure, and a tough economic situation is that South Koreans are among the unhappiest nations in the world. And the country has also had the highest number of suicides per capita in the world for the past two decades. It's so bad that even the government has now recognized it, and it's slowly trying to change things, but so far without any real effect. 
The problem is that although the system is not really working for a lot of people in the country anymore, it's really hard to change it. Chaebols now have a lot of political influence, and the system is working great for them, meaning that any reform is highly unlikely. And while the South Korean economic boom has been incredibly impressive, the country is now stuck with corporations that are too big to fail and too powerful to allow any change, growing youth unemployment rate, and a deeply depressed population.